It's my pleasure to welcome you today to this uh, workshop organized by the AI Ethics and Law Working Group uh, of AI for Belgium around uh, the draft AI regulation suggested, proposed by the European Commission. Um, I would like to thank uh, especially Nathalie Smua from KU Leuven and Jelle Oudemakers from Agoria, co-lead of the AI Ethics and Law Working Group, uh, and Rob Eyman from the Data and Maths Capacity Centrum, Karl Maria Morsch from AI for the Common Good Institute, and Yves Poulet from Crid Nadi for having prepared carefully this uh, workshop. As you know, um, AI Ethics and Law Working Group has already organized several workshops and consultation about uh, the um, ethics guideline of the high level expert group of the European Commission and uh, on the white paper of the um, European Commission. So today uh, it's the third uh, big consultation we do organize around the AI regulation. We will have the pleasure to welcome uh, Commissioner Didier Renders, and we have the honor to welcome also Staats Secretaris uh, Mathieu Michel. Then um, uh, the European Commission with uh, Kilian Gross will do a short keynote. We will have a debate with outstanding panelists and speakers. Then you will have the Q&A. And at the end, um, you will be able to uh, answer several questions in order to give already your feedback on the AI regulation. During the workshop, you will have some uh, survey question that will be also integrated in the consultation. Um, so now I think I'm done for the introduction and I have the pleasure to launch the video of uh, Commissioner Didier Renders, Commissioner for Justice of the European Commission. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank AI for Belgium for your outstanding support for European artificial intelligence and for the vibrant way in which you are promoting uptake here in Belgium. My ambition is for all member states to fully exploit AI's potential. I stand with you in the need to put Belgium on the AI map. Europe can be a global leader in this digital transition, a hub of excellence, where businesses grow and flourish. But we must put people and European values at the centre. The proposal for a first ever EU legal framework for AI does that. It provides a strategy that works for everyone. And I want to thank those among you who have helped us to get to this point. Your input to our public consultation last year was invaluable. In developing the initiative, we were mindful that some uses of AI raise concerns. Citizens have questions about the risks to their fundamental rights. And I know that businesses have concerns about the ethical and liability aspects. The opacity of certain AI systems is particularly relevant in this regard. This is why we have taken a proportionate, risk-based and future-proof approach. We are proposing rules that will allow businesses to innovate and compete on a global level. At the same time, they will ensure trust and therefore uptake of AI systems. Documentation and testing requirements will help users of AI systems to comply with EU fundamental rights and safety rules. They will facilitate the enforcement of existing rules. They will help for detecting biases that could lead to illegal discrimination, for example, or for checking the quality of data sets. The requirements introduced by the new legal framework also cover human oversight, reliability and accuracy of the systems. In terms of governance, national competent market surveillance authorities 
will take on supervisory roles and ensure compliance. We are also empowering supervisory authorities in charge of enforcing fundamental rights. Where an AI application falls in their remit, they shall have access to all documentation about that application. And they can team up with market surveillance authorities to test AI systems. Also, to strengthen aspects like investing in AI, coordinating research and fostering skills, the Commission presented an update of the coordinated plan on AI. It builds on the strong work the Commission and Member States started together in 2018. I understand that businesses also need legal certainty about what the AI liability risks are when they want to invest in it. As Commissioner for Justice, I want to ensure that victims have effective remedy if an AI system causes damage or harm. The European Parliament has therefore called on the Commission to adapt existing civil liability rules. We are aiming to propose legislation and will launch the consultation process in the coming months. We will maintain a close dialogue with the Member States on this topic. Regulating AI is a complex matter, but I believe our proposal for an EU legal framework sets world-leading standards. It is yet another part of the human-centric approach to technology that we have started with the GDPR. And that has inspired many others across the globe and will allow European businesses and industries to innovate and compete on fair terms, while also respecting the values and rights of our citizens. We have got the balance right, and I thank you again for your precious support. All right. Um, yeah, after this European introduction, um, now we will have a short Belgian introduction. And for that, we have the pleasure to welcome today uh, Mathieu Michel, uh, who is the State Secretary for Digitization, Administra Administrative Simplification and Privacy. So thanks a lot, Mathieu Michel, for, uh, for joining us. Personally, I'm very interested to hear uh, what you think uh, about this proposed AI regulation. As I know, uh, the fact that technology has to work for our people and our citizens is something which uh, yeah, is very important to you. So Mathieu Michel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yellow. Uh, it's, a, it's really a great pleasure to, for me to, to be here with, uh, with you today. I hope that, uh, that in, a, in a few days, a few months, we, we will have the pleasure to, to see in, real li in the real life, because uh, I'm a little, little bit tired of those, of those screens. But uh, for the moment, that's the, the, way, we, the way it is. Um, I'm really proud to be the, the witness of, uh, of all that interest about the development of, uh, of AI but also uh, the witness of all that energy uh, about AI. That's really, uh, that, that's really um, outstanding. Um, we all know that uh, AI is one of the biggest opportunities for Europe and also for Belgium. An opportunity to bring more happiness to our citizens, to facilitate uh, their lives, to give them better services, better healthcare, to build a more durable world. You all know the opportunities for the society. Um, it's also an opportunity to develop a stronger economy, uh, build uh, new jobs and new perspectives for innovation. But we also know that every innovation brings with it some risks that we have to consider, that we as a society must manage. Innovation will always be confronted to human creativity, human perception, human trust, and also human responsibility. Therefore, I'm really satisfied to see that EU takes action about regulation in AI. I'm sure that European Union is a good scale to have an impact on the development of a trustworthy AI. And I totally agree on the two principles identified in the European, the European uh, ambition, excellency, and trust. Mankind 
has always found solutions in building a better world for everyone. And this was made possible through innovation, first, humanity, in developing the ability of people to build new solutions and to make them accepted by users. In that way, technology is not an end. It's a tool to build a better world for everyone. Better healthcare, better mobility, better education. The purpose of technology is to make humans feel better. And that is a human responsibility to manage technology, innovation, and AI in that way. And that is the point. We, as human beings, must ensure control and transparency. But mostly, we must guarantee that innovation, ethics, and laws are deeply connected together. I think this proposal is a crucial element to achieve this goal. The current text attempts to preserve innovation by targeting only those AI systems that are risky for safety and for fundamental rights. The text also proposes some obligations that will contribute to more transparency, and that is really a positive uh, thing. It's crucial that our SMEs can innovate and have some legal certainty in order to be able to invest in AI. In this regard, I welcome the fact that the proposal, that the proposal has thought about them and plans to set up regulatory sandboxes where they will be able to develop their applications before going to the market. I also welcome the fact that the draft regulation involves all the relevant stakeholders in the AI ecosystems, developers, distributors, and users, etc. Everyone has a role to play to create a trustworthy AI. The society itself must embrace the debate. It cannot be only an initiated discussion only for experts. The society must also take place in building a trustworthy AI. And in, uh, in that, uh, that challenge, Belgium wants to be an actor uh, of the debate in AI regulation. And excellency and trust are two inspiring principles to guide us through this wonderful challenge. We are in Belgium developing ambitious uh, objectives about AI. I really want us to build a strong position in the AI economy. And I see that we have already a, a lot of strengths that must be used in energy, in healthcare, in logistics, in cybersecurity, but above all, the inc incredibly talented people who work in Belgium on developing strong AI ecosystems. Some of them are with us today, uh, Nathaniel, Nathalie, Mick, Axel, Philippe, Yel. Uh, there are so much energy that I met the, those last months that's weird, that makes me really optimistic. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, in fact, that there is no place like Belgium and its gifted people to build the future. And I feel, I must say that to everybody, every one of you, I feel so lucky to walk beside each one of you. Together, we build confidence and excellency. About confidence, trust, it's building trustworthy AI. We must work on the data, we must reinforce transparency and confidence in the way we use data. You know that's a big challenge in Belgium. Uh, and work is in progress through the Operation Transparence, Operation Transparency, the cadastre of the data set, access to personal data for the citizen, but also the evaluation of the privacy law. We also must, work, must also work on the readability of the algorithms, transparency, accountability, I'm convinced that we must develop tools to help us to make algorithms more readable for the citizen. And we also must work uh, on the regulation at the European level, but also here in Belgium, uh, the evaluation of the privacy law. We, must, we need to ensure that the processes and use of innovation are developed under a, a, a democratic uh, debate. About excellency, 
we must be able to develop strong ecosystems based on AI. There are a lot of beautiful energies that, that, that are already taking part in the AI challenge with many talented people in Belgium, I said it. And in that matter, I think that an important challenge is to connect people. It's a fundamental aspect of my strategy, connecting people around research, animation, ethics, economy, culture, investment, connecting people is a key challenge. And in that challenge, I'm convinced that AI for Belgium, ethics and law, but all, all the group, uh, the, the working group, AI for Belgium, is a keystone in that strategy. Its objective is to identify the key projects on which we have to collaborate to become game changers in AI. By developing a strong network of connected people around common objectives, working on key projects, I'm sure we can build those essentials, confidence and excellency. And I'm sure it will lead us to success. And this success will build Belgium as a smart nation. A smart nation, it is a territory that is able to mobilize itself for its citizens and its businesses around a common vision toward the future with efficiency and with excellency. It's also a territory that develops its ambition all around the world. I will fully support you, you know that, with all my work and all my heart, uh, each energy from Belgium, because that is a smart nation that we are building together. I thank you and wish you a pleasant time around AI. <laughs> Thank you very much, State Secretary Mathieu Michel, for these inspiring and optimistic words, uh, all the while embracing the importance of having a regulatory framework for AI. Um, and I think after these introductory remarks uh, that we have, um, I'm very happy that we can now introduce the next speaker, uh, Kilian Gros from the European Commission. Kilian is head of unit at DigiConnect, um, and he is the head of unit at the unit responsible for having drafted the proposal for an AI regulation. So in other words, it's difficult to imagine a better speaker to tell us more about the content uh, of the proposal. So Kilian, I know you prepared a presentation for us and I'm happy to pass on the floor to you. Um, and up to you now. Thanks a lot, uh, Nathalie, this is most kind. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, and thanks a lot to put me in this uh, list of very um, high ranking guests, but like a Secretary of State and the Commissioner. So I feel more than honored. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you. And I think it's a good moment in time because it's really, um, I think now the right, um, the right place and the right time to discuss this proposal because we just came out on the 21st of April with the proposal on AI. Now we will start the discussion in Parliament and in Council. <clears throat> so we are very happy to get feedback from the different stakeholders um, to inform first everybody, but then as well to take up your thoughts and your ideas in order to see um, where are questions, where things can even still be improved or what you think about what we have um, conceived. Uh, I hope you can now see my presentation, just to, perhaps if you cannot, if everything is fine, perfect. So. Um, I have now the difficult task to take you in 15 minutes to a, present a proposal which has more than 80 pages and is accompanied by an impact assessment which is much longer and a chapeau communication and a coordinated plan. Um, so give me, a, beg me pardon if I'm a bit quick uh, and I can't cover all details. I'm happy to take up questions later and then to, um, to dig into more detail. <clears throat> Our starting point is that we don't want to regulate against AI. We think AI is a great technology, just as the Secretary of State has just mentioned and the Commissioner, uh, because um, it can, you see here the icons, it can bring a lot of benefit in um, connected mobility, in the energy transformation, in healthcare, we have seen it in the COVID crisis when vaccines have been developed as AI, in predictive maintenance in factories to make us more competitive, more efficient, and so on. So there are numerous applications. It's a great technology and that's why <clears throat> beyond the 21st of April came as well out with a package, because we did not only propose um, a regulation, but we propose as well a coordinated plan, a revision of a coordinated plan with 40 support actions together with the member states 
where we want to boost AI because our objective is to um, basically achieve 20 billion euros investments, private and public per year in the EU every year in the coming in the decade which we just started in order to catch up with our trading partners and to a certain extent competitors. So we think it's a great it's a great chance and we always want to build therefore on this uh, as well network on excellence or ecosystem of excellence. But at the same time, <clears throat> we are aware that AI may create risks because some AI applications, some uses of AI may create risk for the safety of our citizens and uh, for the fundamental rights of our citizens. And this we need needs to be addressed from the start in order to create trust because trust is essential for the uptake of AI as just was just mentioned in the introductory speeches. So we think here, um, the story gets complete, our narrative gets completed because only when we manage that uh, the people, the businesses, the undertakings can trust the AI, they will start to deploy it. And that's what we really want. We don't want to regulate against, we want to regulate in favor, but in order to have AI, it must be trustworthy. That's uh, as the executive vice president Vestager once said, the European way of doing things. And that's why we want to have these two sides of this coin. Um, <clears throat> we think that AI displays certain risk features which justify a horizontal approach. And these risk features are in particular opacity, uh, the lack of predictability, the dependency of, of data on data and so on. And these features are unique and uniform for all AI applications. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense for us to, to, go, uh, to go for a horizontal approach, because we had a lot of discussions, of course, in the beginning, shall we just pick out certain areas like biometrics, or shall we go for recruitment, and then go area by area. But we think that the problems linked to AI are um, consistent, and they need an answer, <clears throat> and we should give a consistent answer to all these issues, but that, of course, must be completely uh, in line with the sectoral legislation which exists. At the same time, um, we must be future proof because the technology is very fast developing. So we, we don't know how AI will look like in a couple of years and which techniques may be used and what these techniques can do. So we need to do, we need to create a future proof legislation. And at the same time, and that was a clear echo we got from the public consultation with more than 1,215 uh, submissions. We need to be clear because uh, the last thing business and um, citizens want is an unclear, a vague regulation. And this is, of course, a difficult challenge for us. And here you see a bit of the technique which we have used. Can I just uh, stop you for a second? Um, there seem to be some bars on the slides that you show. You might not see them, but for the audience, there are two black bars. And one of the solu potential solutions would be if you restart the presentation mode. Um, and I okay. see here that uh, our Alexander, who is providing technical support, is also suggesting to minimize uh, the panelist camera window on the screen. So let's try to give it another go just to make sure that we could see, oh, we still see the black bars at this stage. Is there a possibility to minimize the bar on the right, you think? Uh, these are the speakers yeah, I could have. Is it better now? Now we see only a black bar and no presentation at all. Ah, your screen is paused. What happened here? So new, I can stop sharing and I can reshare. Well, we still we still see black bars. I see. Um, can you choose the option share screen instead of share document? And no, another have, your screen is share is paused. I don't know why it is paused. And another suggestion I see here is to first start the presenter mode in PowerPoint and only then share the presentation. And if we don't find a, a good solution, we can live with two black bars, I think. I also think we can make this presentation available to the audience, if I'm not mistaken, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So in any case, everyone will have access to the slides um, and we could see most uh, of the presentation. So if we don't find an immediate solution, we can just continue like this, but let's give it another go. Maybe third time's a charm. We still see small bars, but I think we can we can live with it and just reiterate again. We will share the slides afterwards. So okay. 
Thank you. I will try to read out the most important sentences and you will get in the slides and follow up. So what we have is we took here to be future proof. The idea was we need uh, to find a good balance between on the one hand side being future proof and being clear. And here you see a bit the technique which we have used. We take a rather open definition and here we took at the right hand side, you can see that unless you're blocked by these black bars, you can see we took the definition from the OECD that is rather large and um, technology neutral because you can have a number of techniques falling under that in particular machine learning, of course, but as well others, symbolic reasoning. But then we have an annex one where we try to specify the different techniques which, uh, which we would want to cover and we allow for delegated uh, legislation in order to amend this annex. And by this, we try to catch both objectives, to achieve both objectives, namely to be future proof, so to have a bit of marge de manoeuvre, so to cover future development, and at the same time to be as clear as possible. Uh, <clears throat> the last building block or um, underlying principle of our regulation is the risk um, based approach. We clearly don't want to regulate all AI. We, we see this a bit like a pyramid. And in the pyramid, of course, the bottom is the biggest space. And the bottom here is the AI applications which present minimal or no risk. And they should, be continue, they should continue to be permitted without any restrictions. And these are, for instance, AI systems which filter the spam email or AI systems for predictive maintenance or other things. There's lots of AI which does not uh, present any risk and does not need any regulation. And we want to be very clear on this. We only want to regulate um, really risky applications. Then we have the yellow part, which is an AI which has certain risks, but it doesn't really require that you do a full check and you really make sure that the system functions perfectly well, but you need information. And this is, for instance, when you are exposed to a chatbot that the user should know he or she is not speaking to a human um, interlocutor, but he's, he or she is speaking to, um, to a machine. And then we have the course of regulation, but which is in, in reality, the minority of the applications, we guess between 10 and 15%, these are the high risk cases. And the high risk cases here, we will uh, align with the product legislation, we will ask for an ex ante conformity assessment. So we want to make sure before this AI enters on our market, that it is checked and it is compliant with high standards. And then on top, we have certain AI users which we find unacceptable. And these are, for instance, social scoring by public authorities. These AI users we simply don't want to see in Europe and we want to ban them. And we want to give a clear signal here. I put here on the left-hand side that these different levels are not completely mutually exclusive. It may be that you have a high-risk application, for instance, which as well requires specific transparency obligations. I will come to that later. So if you now move a bit a bit closer and we, uh, we try to climb up this pyramid from the bottom. So we start at the lower end. And here we have minimal and no risk. So there's nothing, no mandatory obligations, but we encourage member states or companies to draw up codes of conduct which are purely voluntary. These could should of course not contradict our regulation, but you could for instance imagine to take other requirements or to cover low risk applications if you think that this is needed or you want to give them the opportunity to show that they uh, voluntarily commit to certain standards. Then we have the yellow layer, so the specific risks. Here I mentioned already, this is basically an information or transparency obligation. And here one case I already have uh, presented is the case of the chatbot, but we have two others. We have uh, the case of the emotional recognition or biometric categorization system, where humans should be notified that they are dealing, that they are um, basically uh, exposed to such a system and the label to deep fakes so the in, normally every citizen should know when it's confronted with a deep fake unless this is clear or obvious from the context or for instance there is a, a this is needed in the framework of a police investigation then if you move further up if we get now to the close to the top of our little pyramid we come to the red zone or the the, the orange zone here this is the uh, high risk cases and the high risk cases here we require, just to remember, we require the ex under conformity assessment. And we see basically two main groups of high risk cases. One group are the safety components of regulated products. So here the AI is part of a product like a medical device, a machine, a robot, a drone. And the product as such is already subject to sectorial legislation because it's considered to be particularly risky. In that case, 
we follow the risk assessment, which is already existing under product legislation. And we consider then the AI system, if it's a safety component of this uh, product, as well as high risk and requirements under conformity assessment. We specify in Annex 2 exactly the legislation which we mean. So it's very clear, you just have to look there. And if you have to do an ex ante conformity assessment, this will, of course, be part of the general ex ante conformity assessment. So that's not a new assessment. It will basically specify the way the AI component must be looked at in the framework of such an assessment. The second group are the self-standing AI systems. And these are the AI systems, for instance, biometric identification, um, the AI systems used for vocational training or for employment purposes. Here. We have identified on the basis of a risk matrix, we have identified in Annex 3, eight categories, which you see here at the bottom of the slide, where we think particular risks may occur. And within these eight categories, <clears throat> we have identified concrete use cases. And only these use cases, so not the whole categories, only the use cases identified in these categories uh, constitute a high risk and therefore need to undergo an under conformity assessment. The use cases may be adapted over time via delegated acts, but of course, always respecting the boundaries of this sector. So we will not go beyond that, but um, we will within these sectors look whether further use cases arise. This should allow us again to be facts-based. We will only look at cases which really cause problems and, and which not are just expected to cause problems in the future. And it will allow us to then adapt dynamically over time our uh, legal text. So here you see a little bit how this would work out if you are in the high-risk world. If you are a provider of such an AI system, you would first have to check whether what you do is with the AI, so whether you fall under the technology, one of the techniques in Annex 1. Then the second thing is you would need to see whether the intended use constitutes a high risk. And that you can see by checking Annex 2 and Annex 3 of this regulation. If you conclude that what you're doing is high risk AI, then you would need to do an ex ante conformity assessment. So you would need to develop a quality management system and a risk management system, and you would have to undergo an ex ante conformity assessment before you enter the market. You will, after that assessment, receive the CE label, and that should show you uh, to all consumers in a very simple way that this product is safe and trustworthy. And then you're allowed to put that product on the market or to use it. Uh, we will look within this ex ante conformity assessment, we will look at the five criteria which are well known from the white paper which we published one year ago, or even a bit more than one year ago, and which are based on the work of our high level groups and have been tested in a pilot already with 300 undertakings. So we will um, use five criteria. We will look at the quality of the training, validation and testing data. We will ask you to provide a, a sufficient documentation of your AI system. We will uh, require a certain degree of transparency and information and the human oversight and of course, you have to ensure a decent level of robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity. And these are the classic criteria. We will basically work in the regulation with an essential requirement approach. So we will define in abstract way which kind of level you need to achieve. And these levels should then be filled out with standards afterwards, which should facilitate each uh, provider be compliant with these requirements. On the very top of the pyramid, you find then the red zone, the prohibitions, those cases we really, those uses we really don't want to see. And here you see these are rather extreme cases. We want, don't want to see subliminal manipulation resulting in physical or psychological harm. These are th cases when you see, um, when you're exposed to screen, uh, to photos on your screen, pictures on your screen, which you can't really realize. And in a subconscious way, you're influenced and this causes harm to you. Whether when you exploit the vulnerability of children or mentally disabled persons and cause harm to them by doing that. It is the classical example would be the toy, uh, basically seducing the child to do something dangerous. The general purpose social scoring by public authorities is covered. So if public authorities would start to grant benefits based on a certain scoring system. And the remote biometric identification for law enforcement purposes in publicly accessible spaces is covered. But here we provide some exceptions, and this is a very narrow exception, but as this is a very particularly sensitive point, let me allow you to go a little bit more in detail on the next slide. <clears throat> what we prohibit is the real-time uh, remote biometric identification for law enforcement purposes in public spaces. We foresee three exceptions to this, namely if the law enforcement authorities look for a victim of a crime, 
if there's a concrete threat to life or physical integrity uh, in the case of a terroristic attack, or if they look for an offender of a serious crime, namely one which is listed in the European arrest warrant. All this can only happen, the use of this biometric identification after um, and it's under authorization by judicial authority and independent administrative body. So what we really prohibit is a 24 hour seven mass surveillance. You can only do this in very narrowly defined cases after a judge or an independent administrative body has authorized this, or in the case of emergency, of course, it has to be repeated, but it's not something you can just run. Every um, remote biometric identification system is considered to be high risk. So it always, here you see the combination, here you always have to undergo the exact conformity assessment and we even have reinforced the criteria for this particular application. So we have enhanced logging requirements and we have a four ice principle. And then, of course, all this must be seen in the context of the existing legislation because we have already a very strong data protection legislation in Europe, uh, the GDPR and the law enforcement directive in particular. Of course, these continue to apply and they prohibit in general already the processing of personal data, or biometric data. And therefore, you need therefore an authorization under uh, um, provided by a national law. And when we clarify, our act is not such an authorization. It just defines the criteria under which the national legislator may authorize such use. So it's rather restrictive. Um, one of the key ideas of this regulation was, of course, how can we make sure that AI is trustworthy on the one hand side, but that we don't stifle innovation. We come here back to the point, my point in the beginning, that we wanted to have a vibrant AI system in Europe, but at the same time, we want to have it trustworthy. And therefore, we propose to set up regulatory sandboxes, uh, which should facilitate the development and uptake of AI. So there are uh, protected areas where companies can try and test before they go to the market and that should facilitate them to get the under conformity assessment. We provide for specific support measures for startups and SMEs. They should have privileged access to these sandboxes. They should pay less fees for the under conformity assessment and they should have access to a particular uh, well-structured information. Uh, and they should be allowed in the sandboxes to, um, to reuse or to repurpose personal data within certain limits. So we try with different means to help the startups and the SMEs so that this doesn't become a burden or an excessive burden, but we don't really want to derogate from the um, general obligation because we think if something is really risky, it does not lose its character of being risky just because it has been constructed or developed by a small company. Last but not least, how shall that all this be implemented? The bulk of the implementations will happen at national level as we are used to that in the product legislation. For the products, this is all very well settled because we have notified bodies, we have notifying bodies and we have market surveillance authorities who will look uh, after the products ex ante and do the ex post market monitoring. This will need to be set up for the self-selling AI. Here we leave a lot of discretion to the member states. We allow even for self-assessment of most of the self-selling AI except biometrics. So we, um, but, of course, this must be efficient. So one thing we require from member states is that they equip those bodies doing these tasks with sufficient financial and human resources. Um, every member state should designate one um, a su supervisory authority. And this supervisory authority <coughs> should be our contact point so that we have one <coughs> administration as a central contact point for the commission. And that should be, this body should be in the European board for AI, which we will create with the Commission and the European Data Protection Supervisor. And this board should allow to ensure a consistent application of this regulation and as well look uh, for further amendments or adaptations of these different lists, which I mentioned uh, en passant. We may set up at the later stage as well an expert group in order to have a, um, a full representation of our society. That is, I think, that would be a very valuable idea, but that will come a bit later once we see where we land uh, in the negotiations on this regulation, but it's certainly something we would uh, very closely consider and have a lot of sympathy for. So we will have a light structure on European level, but we will <clears throat> nevertheless ensure that this regulation is effectively and consistently applied throughout the Union. This was in a very short uh, rough ride, an overview of the regulation. I'm very grateful for your attention and I'm very happy to hour or later to take some questions or go into more detail on some points if you so wish. So, but for the time being, thanks a lot first for your attention.
Thank you very much, Kian, uh, especially for keeping the time so strictly and giving us a lot of information in a short time frame. Um, there were quite some questions that already came in. Um, some of them, I think you already answered in your presentation, but there are a few that came back uh, by multiple people. So I just want to already ask you that question uh, before we move on to the panel. Namely, can you just clarify once again, which entity is responsible to carry out the conformity assessment? Uh, because there has been some unclarity, few people ask the same question and maybe in addition to that question, how can we make sure that the CE label is not misused potentially by providers or users? So maybe if you can already answer that and then we can move on. Yeah, with pleasure. It's indeed, it's a, it's a good question because it's a bit complicated. <clears throat> the ex ante conformity assessment um, foresees different possibilities uh, under the current legislation and be really aligned to the current product legislation. It can be done via an, uh, a third party. So you can have a, cer a certified third party. So you need a, a, a third party like a, a public organization or a private company, which is certified to do this kind of assessment, or it can be done within the one company, though the in-house solution or self-assessment or internal control. Both are possible and both constitute fully fledged ex ante conformity assessments. We foresee for products that we will go for the third party ex ante conformity assessment. So that will be notified bodies which already exist, for instance, for cars or for other technical devices who should do that if, of course, they would first need to be certified uh, by the national administration that they are sufficiently qualified and equipped and they have the knowledge to do this kind of assessment. So they would need a specific certification to do the AI assessment. If they can't do it, they may outsource this to a specified body. And one of the ideas we have, for instance, is that we create this testing and experimentation facilities who could, for instance, provide help. But there must be a body certified to do this kind of test. That is a certified, certified third-party conformity assessment. We foresee as another option for the self-standing AI, except biometric, where we as well foresee third-party certi uh, certification, the internal control. We do this for a very simple reason, because for the self-standing AI systems, this is a complete novelty. The technical devices, the drones, the robots, they already undergo a third-party conformity assessment, and it makes perfect sense then to integrate in that assessment as well the AI assessment. The self-standing AI does not go so far to such a body. And we thought it's perhaps a too big step now to immediately ask them to go to a certified third party. So we will start with an internal control, but we have foreseen in the regulation the option that we may move up to a certified third party conformity assessment in case, for instance, that would not prove to be sufficient. At the same time, you should not forget, because it was a long discussion we had in the uh, run up of this regulation, even the internal control is not without sanction because we have very severe sanctions. We have um, uh, up to 6% or 30 million turnover, whatever is lower, the maximum sanction, there will be an ex post market surveillance. So if you do a, a self-assessment and afterwards it, it turns out that your self-assessment was flawed, uh, you may be exposed to very significant risks. So therefore that may even be sometimes in the interest of an operator to do a certified third party conformity assessment to avoid this. So the sanctions and the complaint mechanism under the market surveillance regulations are there and there will be as well a control this is not to be confused with the kind of light assessment or just self-assessment on a voluntary basis, because you are expected to be as much aligned with the legislation as compliant as if you had done a certified third party conformity assessment. It's just the process is different. The sanctions and the controls exposed are the same. Thank you very much. I think that explains uh, the conformity assessment schedule already a bit better. So I think we can now close this first part um, of our uh, discussion and move to the panel uh, discussion. We have a great, strong panel uh, of, fear, of four female AI experts uh, aligned with Mireille Hildebrand, Peggy Valke, Noemi Bondritter, and Julie Sierpensil. And Kilian has also kindly agreed to stay uh, and comment on the panel discussion as well. Um, we'll work with two rounds of questions. We're uh, always tight on schedule, so, uh, but we also want to foresee the possibility for you as audience to give your input, because we would also like to collect some feedback from you. So before we move to the panel discussion, I'd like to give the floor to Rob Heyman from Kenny Centrum Data Matia Pe, who will just say a little word about how you can interact um, with us. Yes, I hope I've unmuted myself. Yes, 
I did. Thank you for having us here. Um, <clears throat> and we want you to be part of the panel by using WooClub. Um, if you can see my screen, I would advise you to use your mobile device or another device so that you can still follow um, the webinar and, and see everyone speaking there. Um, use the QR code or use the link and don't forget to press submit. If we have um, questions that are open, you can write down your own answer or write or wait until someone else writes something really smart and give it a like as well. This helps if you are a bit time pressed, of course. And we'll now launch the first question. Yes, and maybe just uh, already to announce the first question um, also hinges uh, upon the first question we'd like to ask our panelists uh, who can already prepare themselves for this question, namely, what in general uh, is the opinion on the proposed risk-based regulation? Uh, and so we'll ask each of our panelists, um, what is the good, what is the bad, uh, some first impressions. Yella, can I pass the floor to you? Yes, of course you can. Um, so I hope everyone made it to the WooClap, eh? otherwise you can see the link uh, in the, the chat. So let's kick off our panel. Um, the first panelist I'd like to introduce is uh, Mireille Hildebrand. Um, Mireille, I have to say you have an impressive CV. Uh, um, some of your um, accomplishments, you're a professor of technology law at the VUB uh, and also teach at the Nijmegen University. And very specifically, um, you're also the, the, the principal investigator of the COHUBI uh, projects, uh, which stands for counting as a human being in computational law. Uh, which is a research project where uh, computer scientists and lawyers uh, come together to study uh, computational law. Um, so Mireille, um, we'd like to hear your first impressions of this proposed regulations. What do you think? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, we have just heard a wonderful <clears throat> explanation in a very short time, which is uh, of course by one of the authors of the regulation, but uh, I think that was a, an achievement in itself. What it shows to me and what I also want to share is that this, uh, this regulation, this act is an architecture. So uh, I see many people picking one or two sentences or rules and then beginning to complain, but this is a very tightly woven, complex, multi-dimensional animal, and I think that's a good thing because we are facing a very complex environment. I think that if this AI act as it stands now, uh, of course, after it takes the advice that I'm going to give uh, to change some things, but that's a joke. So I think if it proceeds like this, uh, even if uh, unchanged, it will make an enormous difference that makes a difference. There are many differences in this world within the EU, probably also outside the EU, if it becomes law. And that is because I think that it will create an ecosystem of what I call 4R AI that's resilient. That means that if the environment changes, it's still trustworthy. Uh, robust. That means if somebody is trying to game the system, um, which could of course become very dangerous, think of adversarial machine learning, that the system calibrates and survives, is still uh, trustworthy, that it's reliable, that means it does what it claims to do or is claimed to do, and that it's responsible. So here we go to the fundamental rights aspect. And I think the same for R actually should apply to the regulation, not just to the AI. And I think that's the case. Um, I want to pick out <clears throat> one thing that I particularly like, and that is article 14 about human oversight, uh, because I think it basically takes the human out of the loop. As I've said many times, this phrase, we need a, a human in the loop, uh, I think is not a very productive way of thinking about AI. What we want is that the human is back in the center um, and that it counts 
that, uh, sorry, that that person, the human, counts as a human being and what that means in the context of AI. Article 14 is very clear about the fact that uh, high-risk AI systems, and high-risk is related to the impact of the systems <clears throat> and not necessarily to how they operate, and I think that's a very important choice. Impact both in the sense of safety and in the sense of human uh, fundamental rights, that those who are operating a system like that uh, should have human oversight there are all sorts of uh, requirements, but the two important ones is that the human who has the oversight understands how the system came to its decision or how it came to behaving in a certain way. That's a very heavy requirement, of course. And on the other hand, that that person who is doing the human oversight has the uh, authority, the ability de facto ability to change or even to stop that decision or uh, the behavior of the system. <clears throat> um, uh, there, there are many other things mm -hmm. that I could look into, but uh, maybe we move on to the next speaker. Because... Thank you very much, Mireille. And thank you also for emphasizing uh, that particular article and those requirements, which are indeed very important. Um, so it's my pleasure now to introduce our second panelist, Pehi Valko, is also a colleague of mine at the KU Leuven. Pehi is Professor of Law and Technology at the KU Leuven and Vice Dean Research at the Law Faculty. She's co-director of CTIP. She's an executive committee member of Leuven AI and also principal investigator in the security and privacy department of IMAC. And on top of all of that, she's co-director in the Kenny Center in Data and Pe. Um, and she's also vice chair of the CAHAI, so the Council of Europe Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence. Pehi, the same question to you. Can you tell us just your first impressions, good, bad, about this regulatory proposal? Yes, thank you so much, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I know our time is limited, so what is good about this text is definitely that it now um, I'd say provides concrete material to have a discussion. Yeah? So we've been talking about ethical guidance for several years. Uh, we've seen ethics guidance popping up at several levels. Um, and uh, the tide has been turning in the sense that there is large consensus that we have to take a step further and come with a legal instrument. So here we have the first legal instrument, at least, I would say a first legal instrument that focuses on artificial intelligence, because I would like to repeat what Mireille um, also put on the table. This isn't the only instrument dealing with artificial intelligence. We have already many laws out there that deal with consumer protection, product safety, liability, um, processing of personal data, and those instruments remain applicable. Yeah? Um, so now we have a dedicated instrument focusing on artificial intelligence that is undoubtedly um, open for, or uh, there is scope for improvements. Um, indeed, uh, people shoot on, on different elements and think, oh, this is not clear enough. And I have full sympathy um, with, with what Killian said that um, we had to strike balances. On the one hand, we, want a future-proof instrument. On the other hand, we need to provide sufficient clarity. Now, what we shouldn't forget is that laws are not computer codes. And I was actually thinking, Mireille, that you would uh, bring this up. But since you didn't, uh, I take uh, the liberty to do so. So to those um, raising criticism about notions that aren't sufficiently clear um, or that need to be further specified at national level or through case law. Well, this is, this is normal procedure with law. Um, law gets further shape as it is being implemented and it evolves also with time and developments on the market. Um, so the fact that certain notions will have to be interpreted by courts or by regulatory, re regulatory authorities is perfectly normal. And I would say that if we try to provide so much detail and clarity in a legal text that is a regulation, 
and the hands an instrument that applies in all the member states at different levels, then that would um, stifle legal developments enormously uh, as developments go along. So this instrument needs to strike indeed a balance between providing clarity, but being future proof at the same time. Another balance that the instrument needs to strike is um, foster innovation and uh, economic development on the one hand and protecting um, our fundamental rights, our consumer rights, citizens' rights. Um, so from certain provisions, um, we see that this is indeed what the Commission intends to achieve. Uh, certain applications are prohibited or proposed that they would be prohibited and high risk um, systems will need to comply with certain requirements. Now, if there is some scope for improvement, I'd say that there is definitely scope to bring the citizen, to bring the consumer more, give, give that um, actor a more prominent role. Because for the moment, it's an instrument that imposes obligations, that talks about market integration, harmonization, in internal market, standardization. But at in no provision you see clear rights for the citizens where if they have a problem, should they go and complain? Is this something that member states will decide? Should they go to the court? Um, depending on, on the, the, the authority that member states put in place, they may be in charge of dispute resolution or not. So this is, I think, an area where, um, yeah, hopefully some more clarity will be provided in parliament in the discussion in parliament or at the level of the council what is also yeah striking is that a lot of uh, power is actually delegated to the european commission so i guess this is also something that the council of ministers or the european parliament may want to um, change uh, during the the discussions i understand that this is to be flexible and to to, to react um, to developments when needed. Uh, if only the Commission has to change um, annexes that is much, or, or can adopt implementing acts, that's of course more flexible than when European Parliament and the Council of Ministers have to intervene. But I can imagine uh, that not all the member states will agree with the, the delegated powers that the Commission has uh, reserved for itself. And perhaps a final comment. Um, there are quite some exceptions um, to the rules uh, the regulation, the proposed regulation excludes a significant um, number of situations. Um, for instance, take the Annex 9, um, where reference is made to a lot of EU institutions um, that will not have to uh, follow uh, the rules that the Commission has now put on the table. But um, Maybe I should stop here. Yeah. I, I haven't looked at the time, but I've probably been speaking too long already. It takes Sorry a lot, Becky. Um, before we go to our next speaker, very quickly, some information from the first poll we did with the Woo Club. 57% uh, of the at uh, attendees believes that the risk-based approach is the best way and only 6% disagrees. So um, uh, that's some interesting first inputs. Our next panelist, um, after two people from academia, uh, we now have uh, Julie Scherpenseel, uh, uh, who works for ML6. Uh, Julie is a strategy officer at ML6, and ML6 is one of the uh, innovative AI companies uh, that we have here in Belgium. Uh, next to that, Julie was also the Young ICT Woman of the Year. Um, so Julie, maybe from uh, the perspective of a company which is building a lot of AI applications, what do you think uh, on this regulation? Um Thank you for the invitation and thank you, Killian, for the uh, clear overview. Um, I think, first of all, we do welcome the AI regulation. Uh, we think it's uh, important to develop trustworthy AI applications. And we also saw that the lack of a published AI regulation combined with the expectation that it was going to be very rigid resulted in companies waiting to make uh, certain AI investments. So it's definitely a step forward to have this proposal. We're also in favor of the risk-based approach. And we feel that the EU is asking the right questions and is addressing the right risks. However, 
uh, in order for regulation to stimulate innovation, it needs to, on the one hand, increase trust with consumers, but on the other hand, also reduce legal uncertainty for companies. And in order to do that, it's crucial that the regulation is clear and easily applicable. And we feel that right now, uh, the specifics of the regulation, the definitions, the guidelines, the benchmarks aren't clear enough yet, which makes it hard to determine exactly what uh, the impact of the regulation will be. So for instance, what does putting an AI on the market mean? Uh, does it apply to non-production systems? Um, when we talk about ex ante conformity assessments, is this before you put it into production or does it also apply during a POC or an MVP phase? Um, how do you determine whether residu residual risks are acceptable, et cetera? Um, so we, we still need a lot of like clarifications and specifications in order to, to really make it applicable in practice. Um, what, what is clear though, is that uh, for uh, high risk applications, the administrative burden and the cost will be high. Um, which, which is okay for companies uh, uh, like ours who, who only develop AI applications. Um, but for other organizations and especially smaller ones, it will be harder to build the business case for these high risk applications, even if the, the benefits outweigh the risks. So it will be important to make sure that the red tape stays proportionate, but more importantly, it will be crucial that um, it's still easy for companies to experiment with AI and to be able to test solutions without having to make huge upfront investments or to have to deal with uh, complex digital uh, innovation hub structures um, because that innovation is, is really yeah, essential for innovation. You need to be able to experiment to build your business case and to test the technical feasibility. Um, and if yeah, we look at the regulatory sandbox, for instance, we felt that there weren't many concession, concessions so that it, it still needs a push to make it applicable in a scalable way. So we, yeah, or I hope that the final document will um, address this concern uh, in a sensible way. Thank you very much, Julie. And also thank you for sticking to, I know, the short allocated time to make a lot of remarks. Um, Killian, just for your information, uh, you will have the opportunity to reply to everything that you've heard so far um, after the first round of questions. So stay put and prepare your answer. But before that, I want to introduce the last but not least panelist, Noemi Bontritter. Noemi is a researcher at the Research Center in Information, Law and Society, CRITS of the University of Namur. And uh, she's a member there of the media unit. And on top of that, she also works on the information ethics working group of the Information for All program of UNESCO. Uh, her research focuses particularly on the disinformation phenomenon online and on the ethical and legal implications of AI technologies used by public services. So Noemi, also for you, the general question, what is the good or what is the bad about this regulatory proposal? Uh, thank you for inviting me and for this presentation. Um, yeah, for me, as the EU is willing to increase the, its competitiveness and promote innovation in the AI sector, uh, the initiative to address some key concerns uh, regarding AI systems is highly welcome. Um, first, the definition of AI systems provided for seems adequate, uh, since it is inclusive of the different AI techniques, techniques and it is uh, future-proof. As stated uh, in the recitals, AI systems need to be cl clearly defined uh, to ensure legal certainty, but also need to provide uh, flexibility to accommodate future technological developments. Um, in my opinion, Annex 1 um, provides, uh, um, uh, achieves this aim. Um, I take this opportunity to point out that UNESCO uh, in its upcoming recommendation uh, is unfortunately not providing any clear definition of AI system and does therefore not give enough precisions to uh, regarding the scope of application of the, the upcoming regulation, uh, regulam, regulation, um, recommendation. Sorry. 
uh, it is uh, justified by the, by the fact that technology is evolving fast. But in my opinion, uh, the approach undertaken by the EU is providing is proving that is it is possible to have a clear but also future-proof definition of AI systems. Um, the risk-based approach is also pertinent since AI techniques and practices uh, can be used in multiple ways that do not necessarily present, present the same risks regarding human rights and fundamental freedoms. Uh, for instance, uh, the use of AI systems uh, to manage the agenda of a doctor uh, do not pose uh, the same risks uh, as the ones uh, that can be used to predict the future state of uh, patients. Um, some AI systems uh, indeed need to be prohibited and high risk uh, ones uh, require, full, full, uh, require to fulfill um, particular requirements uh, like uh, the ones provided for. Um, regarding the requirement of uh, human oversight, uh, oversight I uh, agree with uh, Mireille uh, Hildebrandt, and it may be difficult uh, to ensure that the assigned uh, individuals will effectively be able to oversee the system. Um, in neural network uh, based AI, uh, even the creators will not be able to replicate or understand the logic applied uh, by the AI system when arriving to uh, any given uh, con conclusion. Um, one of the main use of AI systems uh, will be in the public sector. And uh, in, in my opinion, this sector should be a model for the ethical use of AI. Um, but it is undeniable that public services rely on external actors uh, for the development of AI systems. And in this regard, uh, there may, may be a difficulty of qualification. Um, like in the regulation, uh, providers uh, are defined as um, a natural or legal person, public authority, agency, or other body uh, that develops an AI system or that has an AI system developed with a view to placing it into service under its own name or trademark, whether for payment or free of charge. Um, and uh, users on their side as, uh, are defined as any uh, natural person and, and so on um, that, um, that is using an AI system under its authority. Uh, here, uh, my question is, is um, are public authorities providers or users? Uh, indeed, uh, while they would not uh, have developed the system, they may put the, into service uh, the system under their own name or trademark. Um, if they are considered as providers, they will have to fulfill all uh, providers' obligations provided for in uh, Article 16 to 23, including establishing, implementing, documenting, and maintaining risk, uh, risk management system. Um, in most cases, it will also have to assess the conformity of the system with the regulation in accordance uh, with Annex 4. Uh, and this would certainly necessitate a new team of experts within the public sector. Um, I also want to emphasize that notified bodies uh, that are created uh, by this, uh, that need to be created uh, according to this uh, regulation, will assess the conformity of only uh, high risk AI systems in the era of biometric identification and categorization of natural persons. Um, but it may be interesting to add other systems uh, to such external audits, uh, in particular when they are used uh, in the public sector. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, I'm afraid I'll need to cut you okay. there because the time is uh, running short. But I think we already heard uh, quite an important list of suggestions and questions as well. Uh, towards the European Commission. So I'm going to ask Kilian, um, who probably prepared a reply in the meantime, to also briefly um, react to uh, what you have just heard. I think you had a lot of comments, also some questions. Um, so what is your reaction uh, on this in a few minutes? You will make it easier for me because I shouldn't just speak too quickly and I should nevertheless try to reply to all the very interesting and valuable remarks. So thanks a lot for, for the, the fruitful and thoughtful 
uh, comments which you made. I think on, uh, on what Mireille said, I can only agree. This is, um, we, of course, we try to make it as easy as possible, but it is an architecture and it's complex because we have a lot of different AI applications. We have AI in a robot, we have AI in a recruitment tool, we have AI in, a, in an emergency call system, in a dispatching system, but they all have these risk features and we try to cover them and we try to integrate that in the legislation as it exists often in these sectors, because often we are active in sectors which are high risk and are already heavily regulated. So we, we put a lot of thought into this to find a, a smart way of um, having uniform and consistent criteria and not duplicating processes and procedures excessively. And that, of course, was a, was a challenge. And um, we were ourselves a bit astonished in the end that the legal act then had 80 pages. We would have loved to have it shorter, but that was the shortest we could, we could think of, uh, given the complexity of the, of the exercise. So I, I'm very grateful for your remark, because, of course, you can pick out certain elements and say there should be more. Uh, but I think there as well, you're right. Uh, I think that was what Peggy mentioned. If we would go to down to more detail, this would get be really unreadable and un unmanageable. There must be as well, good legislation must have some room to, to breathe and to develop. And we have seen that as well in, um, in other areas. Uh, so I'm quite grateful for this, for, the, for this remark, because um, for instance, on the requirements, we try to be specific, we try to give details, we try to explain, uh, Mireille mentioned that the Article 14, we gave a lot of thought, but it's impossible in such a regulation to identify how human oversight should be spelled out for all the different AI applications. We would have, I don't know, 50 articles of this, you know, if you wanted to do that. So we, what we think, what we can do, and what makes sense is that we agree as a legislator, what should be the level, what should be insured, and then, we can work with standardization bodies for the different applications in order to translate this into technical and practical requirements. This, I think, is a better way of doing law, because otherwise we would have an extremely complex law which would already be outdated the moment it would be adopted, because the, the development will not stop just because we are legislating. It will continue, and we need to be agile. <clears throat> this is, um, if I then turn a bit to what, what, what Peggy has said, no clear rights for citizens. This is um, a criticism which we have heard a number of times now in the public debate. Why don't you have a new complaint mechanism? Or why is there not a new body to, to track complaints about AI? Our starting point was a bit different. Our starting point was to think about why is it that AI may make existing remedies for non-discrimination, for instance, if you have a recruitment case, less efficient. This is not because we have no body to check this. But this is because the body checking the non-discrimination claim, the equality body, for instance, will not have, will not understand the AI. And the employer who has not invited somebody and the, the person may think that he or she is discriminated, uh, may not be able to make their case because the, both will stand before this AI like a black box and nobody will really understand how the decision was made. This is what we want to, to cover and to bridge. We don't want to introduce new remedies as such in the first place, but we want to make sure that the remedies which exist for non-discrimination and for product legislation, that they are fully efficient. And that's why we have an Article 64, this a very important obligation that um, these market surveillance authorities have to give access to the information which they have to all these equality bodies and all non-discrimination bodies so that they can do the, their job. We don't think that this is a place to add other bodies for this. And we should not forget that we have the market surveillance regulation fully applicable. So if you then think that the AI is not good or your uh, requirements are violated or something, you can turn to your market surveillance authority and they can as well have imposed very sensitive fines. So, but in, in reality, our core idea is that we want to reinforce existing remedies. We don't think that we need a particularly new set of remedies just for AI. We need to make sure in the different contexts that the remedies which exist work well. And this is what our regulation should mainly deliver and make practically feasible. Okay, sorry, sorry, Kilian. <laughs> we are we are going to move oh. to the, the next part. You will still have some time to make a final comment uh, after that. That's um, all fine for me. Thanks. <laughs> but thanks a lot anyway already. So um, for the next part, we prepare. We prepared some questions to ask to our panelists, eh, but we're not only going to ask them to the panelists, also to you. So it's time again to take the WooClap on your cell phone on, uh, on another tab, because when we ask the question to the panelists, uh, Rob will also launch it on the WooClap so you can give your opinion. And the first, uh, there it is again, uh, wooclap.com slash AI rec. There you can 
participate. So the first question will be uh, to Noemi Bontreder. Um, Noemi, um, in Kilian's presentation, uh, we saw quite an extensive list of um, high-risk uh, AI systems. Uh, um, what's your view on this list? Is it, uh, is it complete? Um, is it maybe too restrictive? Uh, what do you think? Uh, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, for me, the list of uh, higher risk AI systems is uh, is kind of precise. It's it, it is at least much more precise than the one that was proposed by the European Euro European Parliament in its uh, annex. Um, and it does uh, provides for more uh, legal uh, clear, uh, certainty uh, for the providers and less uh, interpretation. Uh, however, uh, there are some uh, unclear aspects in my opinion, uh, especially um, regarding the AI, AI systems uh, that are considered high, high risk according to Article 1.6. Um, in the case of uh, machine machinery products, it is actually clear because there, um, for uh, only in the new uh, proposal for regulation, actually, because uh, there is an annex that uh, states all the high-risk AI um, machinery products that are subject to a third-party assessment. Uh, but it is not the case uh, for, uh, for example, the the toys. Uh, they are uh, defined as uh, products that are uh, toys that are used by children under 14 years old. But the ones that are subject to uh, third party assessments are the ones that were uh, where the manufacturer did not um, follow harmonized standards. Uh, so my question is, um, maybe even if the, pers the manufacturer followed the harmonized standards, it's, it, it is possible that the use of AI systems in the product will make the product high risk. Um, and uh, all the requirements of the regulation should be followed, even if the, the standards uh, were followed by the manufacturer. Um, yes, uh, another, um, another um, point, maybe I just say this one and then uh, we go is the fact that the, the list uh, only focuses on uh, risks, risks for individuals and completely um, forgets risk for uh, the society as a whole. And actually the European Parliament uh, did not forget that and uh, focused on risks for elections and risks for um, uh, about disinformation uh, on the web. And uh, here, um, AI systems that uh, give recommendation for content could be considered as high risk because they, they, they form the opinion of a person, even if it will not lead to physical or mental harm for the individual, because this uh, last uh, question is um, actually prohibited right? be, because the, the first uh, prohibited AI system is the one that, uh, that, um, that, that, that pushes someone uh, to, to have physical or mental harm uh, by uh, subliminal techniques. Um, so actually the, the Digital Services Act um, provides for transparency requirements uh, for uh, recommender systems, but I think recommender systems are also high risk for society as a whole and should be uh, in this list. Um, also, uh, it is the same with the moderation uh, AI system uh, because it is a high risk for uh, freedom of expression and thus for uh, democracy as a whole. Um, Thank you very much, Louis, um, because your point already leads me to the next question that we're going to ask the next speaker because you were already mentioning some of the prohibited AI applications. So I'm going to move over to Mireille, but at the same time, this is also a question we're launching uh, to the audience in the poll. Mainly, what are your impressions about the list of prohibited AI systems? All right, so there is also a set list there. Killian set them out. Mireille, what is your view? And the audience uh, in the WooClap, what is your view on this? Yes, thank you. Well, I must admit I'm still studying that because um, this, this is very tricky, of course. 
The first thing I want to say is that I like very much that um, this is suddenly not about AI systems, but about AI practices. Um, and I think that's important. So uh, the things that are prohibited are, and it's not even about use. Huh? Use is also a term that is very often used, but it's a particular uh, type of, of use that's part of a certain practice. So I like that. So very briefly, it's about manipulation of human behavior to circumvent users' free will. It's about exploitation of vulnerable groups and it's about social scoring. And then the fourth one, which is suddenly about more like a, a system, remote biometric identification systems in publicly accessible space. I want to talk about the first three briefly. Um, and I think Noemi already cut the grass away from me because this was a very good point. So I'm sort of disappointed manipulation, exploitation, and social scoring have a huge effect at the level of society. Now, if we're going to say that's only prohibited, if we can somehow identify individual physical or psychological harm, then these are lame ducks, because we all know from liability law that that's devil's uh, probation. That's too difficult. So I'm very curious why this choice was made. Um, it, it leaves a lot of systems that we really don't want off the hook. Um, sorry, I'm saying systems, I mean practices, uh, and that's really the better term here. Uh, so I reiterate that and I want to connect it with the upcoming uh, regulation or uh, directive, I don't know, on liability. I could imagine that you prohibit this is administrative law. This, this regulation is administrative law. So you prohibit these sort of practices and then private law liability, of course, you don't even have to say that, that will require um, individualization of harm uh, and that will be difficult enough. So probably there will be, have to be some relaxation in terms of strict liability uh, or whatever. But I, I would, I really, uh, I can understand it's very difficult, but uh, I still think that's a missed chance. Um, mm -hmm. Then I, I want to briefly say about the biometric categorization. Oh, yes. My question is biometric categorization, not identification, but categorization and emotion recognition systems will very often be used to manipulate or exploit uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, that's a prime example where it will be very difficult to, prov to prove individual harms. And I think that these systems, uh, uh, NX3 under one has as a heading biometric identification and categorization, and then suddenly speaks only about the identification. And from the explanation of, of uh, Killian Gross, I now understand that that is meant to allow the commission at a later point to add the categorization. I think that biometric categorization and emotion recognition systems, where the latter, in my opinion, are based on pseudoscience, so very problematic, uh, they should be categorized as at least as high risk. Because what I love about the requirements for high risk systems is they are quality requirements they will tease out all crappy scientific stuff that is not scientific, um, that is uh, sold with a lot of PR and no substance. So we really need that for emotion recognition systems. Is the requirements of the risk documentation. Ah, yes, and then I, last thing, um, in, I don't remember the article, I think it's 15, there is the requirement for high risk systems of uh, cybersecurity, accuracy and something else. Now we all know that accuracy doesn't mean anything if you don't look at precision and recall. So a system that has 95% accuracy might have precision of 40%. That means if a decision affects me and that system is claimed to have 95% accuracy and it has precision of 40%, 
and it affects me. That's horrible. So I, I would love to see that term somewhere in that article. All right, super. Thanks a lot, Mireille. That uh, gives a very clear pointers. Um, the next question, um, so again, uh, I direct you to the WooClap. I will ask to Julie Scherpenzeel. Uh, uh, we see here the list is um, mostly incomplete. That's a lot of, um, a lot of feedback there. So uh, Julie, um, also in Kilian's presentation, we saw that uh, Europe will introduce a sort of uh, AI CE label. Um, and mainly my question to you is, uh, do you see any value of this type of CE label? Uh, what's your opinion on that? Um, I think to be seen, um, the proposal states um, that the goal of the CE label is to make it easier for AI products to freely move within the internal market. Um, and I think for physical products, that, that makes sense, but it seems a bit less applicable to um, software systems that are not physical products, and especially if they're just developed um, by a company for internal use. Um, so if it's just seen as a quality label, then I'm not convinced it will add a lot of value. Um, but if it ensures the provider um, that the AI system is considered compliant with EU regulation, then I think it, it makes sense because it will create a safe environment, basically, for innovation. Um, in any case, it will be important um, that obtaining that label doesn't uh, become a bottleneck for uh, putting products uh, on the market or, or into service. Thank you, Julie, also for being so to the point on your answer. We love that, especially since we're short of time. Um, and I'm going to address the last question of this second round uh, to Pehi. And so Kilian, be prepared um, to reply because you got, again, a lot of questions and comments. Um, Pehi and to the audience, Next question would be, at what level uh, should AI governance be situated? And with that, we mean at what governance level? So are we talking, should it rather be at the national level, European level, a mix, or even international level, Peggy, since you're also working with the Council of Europe framework? I can, I can be clear and short. This is a shared responsibility. Um, so the, there should be a mix between the higher level is uh, European international levels on the one hand and then the national regional levels on the other hand. I think that's also in the direction which the answers went. So you indeed, Natalie already pointed to the Council of Europe um, actively working also um, on the, uh, on, on, yeah, finding the best legal instrument for artificial intelligence. There is, besides the EU and the Council of Europe, also the OECD, the UNESCO working on certain initiatives, but the EU and the Council of Europe are the two actors um, at the supranational level who can take that can take binding instruments that can adopt binding instruments. So, from that perspective, I think it's important that we not only look to the proposed regulation by the European uh, Union, but also what is taking place at the level of the Council of Europe. Um, the Council of Europe's mission is clearly uh, to set standards in relation to human rights, rule of law, and democracy. So. Perhaps some of the shortcomings um, in the regulation or will undoubtedly be taken up at that level and uh, looking uh, more broadly at the impact of AI systems in society, democracy, rule of law. Um, also looking at AI systems um, which may pose risks, even if no tangible harm right, can be demonstrated um, or um, adopting a more rights-based approach. Um, to give one example, one concrete example, um, it was already uh, mentioned before by the previous speakers that um, emotion recognition systems have posed considerable risks. Um, earlier this year, the um, uh, Consultative Committee uh, 108 of the Council of Europe adopted guidance uh, guidelines on um, for instance, facial recognition systems and emotion recognition systems, uh, and actually advised that those should be prohibited. So this is something that is also, uh, of course, taken up within the context of the Apple Committee on Artificial Intelligence. Um, uh, another example might be that since the, the proposed regulation of the European Commission is, is focusing on obligations for 
for those providing and using AI systems, certain gaps may emerge. Uh, uh, when we were discussing last week with the students, um, some of the aspects of the proposed regulation, I, we have very clever students in Leuven, as you know, Natalie, one of the students said, but what about uh, deep fakes if the, if the, the user of, a, of the AI system should make it transparent that deep fakes are, are generated, but what if this is disseminated and somebody takes out that, that of that label and further disseminates it? Uh, that, that actor is not considered a user of an AI system. So there, other frameworks will have to uh, come in also at national, regional level. I think important uh, aspects will have to be taken up, um, including creating the awareness and having the public debate. Um, and this is also where the Flemish Expert Center on Data um, in, and Society, for instance, plays an important role um, to further uh, specify what is needed to make this work in practice. Okay, thank you, Peggy. And I see that Rob in the chat, by the way, shared uh, the results and the audience shares the view because 47%, I see now it's 70%, but still the large part thinks that cooperation is needed on national and European level, which makes sense. Um, Kilian, over to you. You have the difficult task of wrapping up uh, this panel discussion by answering at least some of the points, if you can, um, that have been raised so far. So any answers that you can give us, please. Now I will be less ambitious. I will not try to answer everything because it will be too long, but at least perhaps some of the points uh, quickly and then the more, some the more general. On the pub, I didn't, men I didn't come back on, on Ruimi's question on the public um, providers. And here it's just because it's a question which comes often. There can be both. Eh? If you develop as a public authority yourself the AI system, you will be a provider, but you can as well be um, a user at the same time once you, you put it into use. So that doesn't exclude each other. We want to treat the self development as the same way as uh, if you buy, if you're just a user and you just buy the AI from a shelf from a third party um, provider. Uh, perhaps two or three more general remarks. There was a lot of discussion on the high risk list, whether this is too short or whether other things are, are missing. We wanted to be really precise, so we wanted to be facts based. So we tried only to take up cases where we have evidence. We have categories. Um, it was mentioned by Mireille, um, um, biometric categorization, which we could allow for extensions, but we would first like to see them evidence and really have a clear cut case before we want to put up further use cases, but we wouldn't exclude that. We think it makes sense to start as a relatively, not, not sure, but let's say manageable list of things which are clear and where we have evidence and not go too far in the start as well as to distribute a learning and a living approach. That is a bit our, our idea. The self-assessment um, is, I think, a good idea when you have a standard because it facilitates for the operator the market access. And that's why we allowed this as well for high-risk AI, because this is a practice which is often used in productization. There was a number of criticism here about the notions, about the concepts. I think this is, if you look at product legislation, you will find a lot of answers for this because providers, market access, putting into service are all terms which are regularly used. And we think that makes sense. And it's, it's helpful if you have a standard and you can do a self-assessment in order to, to be quicker and to avoid administrative costs. On the practices, um, yes, these um, prohibited practices are narrow. Um, but we think we shouldn't see that in isolation because there is there are other acts we don't need now to prohibit everything which we may not want because there is the unfair commercial practices directive we have the dsa we have other instruments which allow a modulated uh, approach for uh, difficult items so here we wanted to really focus on specific ai problems which are not addressed by other legislation that doesn't mean that everything else may be desirable or uh, unlimitedly allowed I think um, the EC label here, <clears throat> that's why we didn't go for a voluntary label, because we want to make sure that when you have an EC label, the consumer the, can trust that the, the thing is either not high risk or it has been checked. It is compliant with high quality requirements. So you don't need to know anything about AI if you have a CE label on the product or on your software, you know it's, it's fine. It can either not do serious harm or it has been checked. And last but not least, we think this um, shared responsibility makes a lot of sense. We don't want to create too much burden on European level, but we think we need some European uh, coordination in order to make sure that we have a similar level of um, protection and application of this act in the, uh, in the EU. 
We have seen in other actors this may be difficult, uh, but I think what we tried is to find here the right balance. And then I stopped because I see we run out of time. But you know, it's my baby, so I could speak for hours, but that would be a bit unfair. <laughs> no worries, Gillian. Thanks a lot for contributing. Maybe um, yeah, as we are indeed a bit out of time, I have one question I would like to take from the chat uh, very specifically. How does the European AI regulation address gender bias? Um, it, it's not something I think which is directly referenced in there, or is it, um, is it connected in a way? Maybe towards Kilian, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> it addresses bias as such in the data requirement. Uh, there is a very clear link to, to bias, and that, of course, includes gender bias as any other bias, uh, which may, uh, may, may be the result of um, unbalanced the data sets. All right. That is a very clear answer. OK. Um, oh, Mireille, uh, you have a final comment, I think. You're muted still. Sorry, I'm taking even more time. Um, now I get messages, I'll mute myself. So this is precisely the problem of biometric categorization. That's why I mentioned it. Gender bias, uh, non-binary people, etc. Mm. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot to all the panelists. Uh, now we're not done yet. Eh? Uh, we're going to over to some um, some quick next steps. I think Natalie will give us a short um, update on what we'll do and eh? what what we've heard today from all of you. Yes, indeed. So um, the European Commission already held a public consultation on its white paper on AI, uh, so that is passed. However, there is still an opportunity to give some uh, feedback to a consultation up until the 9th of July on the regulatory proposal. And this feedback will then sent by the Commission to the European Parliament and the Council to be used in the negotiations that will be held there because I guess everyone is aware this is just a proposal it's the very first step. It might even take years, I guess, before this uh, regulation becomes actual law. But in the meantime, uh, the text will be negotiated between the Commission, the Parliament and the Council. And so as we have done in the past with our uh, ethics and law working group in AI for Belgium, we've tried to collect AI for Belgium feedback on uh, several Commission documents. And this time we would like to do the same for the proposed AI regulation. So the idea is to draft a document based on the feedback that you will be providing us through the tool that you've been using today and also through the discussions we had today. And um, on that basis, we will prepare our first draft and send this to uh, AI for Belgian members in the week of the 14th of June. You will then have two weeks, uh, the usual time that we've given to our members to reply, to make any comments. Uh, of course, this will not be super detailed uh, feedback, but really the main points that we would like to make. And then based on that feedback, we will finalize uh, the report by the 9th of July and submit it to the consultation. So that's in terms of next steps. Cool. Yella? Yeah, indeed. Um, and as mentioned, uh, we used to do this in a big meeting room with post-its, uh, gather everyone's feedback, but unfortunately we cannot do it yet. So we'll, we'll keep using this app. I'll explain a bit more later, but first, uh, maybe I'd like to call back Nathanel Ackerman, the general manager of AI for Belgium. Maybe Nathanel, you have some closing words. What did you think? Was it interesting today? Thank you, Yala. <clears throat> yes, it, it was interesting more than... Uh... 250 people have attended this uh, workshop and many uh, of the registrants have asked for the recording yet. Um, so uh, there were so many interesting remarks and comments. Uh, we have registered, recorded all, also the, the chat that can be an input uh, for the position paper we will write. Um, I, I would like to thank uh, our outstanding speakers, Kilian Gross from the European Commission Professor Peggy Val from KU Leuven, uh, Professor Mireille Hildebrand from VUB, uh, Noemi Bontrido from Creed Nadi, and Julie Scherpenskill from ML6. Would like also to, to thank uh, very much Alexander Rika and Kasper Karpa from BOSA who supported the technique here, um, and, and Rob also for, for the, the survey. Uh, just a, a few words about the next step in AI for Belgium, apart from uh, what uh, Natalie just explained. On the end of May, we will uh, co-organize with uh, 
the Netherlands Embassy and Economic Mission with a specific focus on else uh, smart building logistic AI for Gov and Numetric AI. There will be also a specific slot on NLP in Dutch. Um, so uh, you are pleased to, to, to participate. It's uh, completely free for Belgian participants. Um, we will have also uh, the first um, specific workshop from the AI ethics assessment tool project that is led also by AI ethics uh, working group, uh, specific on else um, human resources and AI for Gov during the month of June. Uh, AI for Gov, also the, the working group uh, from AI for Belgium will present the result of the survey we've launched uh, by the end of March, beginning of April on AI adoption within the public services uh, that has been done with uh, Tallinn University, Colin Van Noort and uh, the GRC. And uh, finally, there are many, many events um, uh, from all partners also like that and Matskapek in the Centrum, like Fari. Um, uh, we will provide all this on the agenda that is available on the website, ai4belgium.be. So please, if you want to uh, be aware of uh, all what happened in Belgium for the moment, you can still register off the LinkedIn page if it is not done or on the uh, ai4belgium.be website. All right, super. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Nathanel. <laughs> and so I'm going to call Rob. Rob, are you still with us? Yes. So as mentioned, uh, we're going to start now gathering some more feedback. We asked some general questions, but now we would like to go into a bit more detail. So um, everyone, hopefully you are still there. Um, if you are, please take your mobile phone uh, um, and Rob is going to guide us through the next set of questions of WooClap. Go ahead, Rob. Yes, let's do this really quickly because we are literally between the soup and the potatoes, as we say in English. Um, no, uh, we have to leave because it's time for your dinner, of course. So the first question we had is a fundamental one. Uh, do we need a new AI regulation? Um, so I'll give you five more seconds, no, let's say 10, to answer this question, um, as this is our limited way of gathering feedback for this uh, position paper. It's five more seconds and uh, we're happy to see, and I hope Killian is happy to see it as well, that most people either agree strongly or agree, simply agree um, that we need a new regulation. So on to the next question. And I'm really happy to see that 45 people have actually stayed to answer these questions. Um, we also wanted to have a look at different parts of the AI definition that was presented by Killian earlier um, to see what parts you like. So you can give a grade between one and five stars, five being really good, one being not that uh, good, to see what the general sentiment is with regard to, to this definition. And we really value your feedback so that we can already pinpoint or prioritize what you deem important. This takes a little bit longer. The next questions are open, so um, please bear with me. Uh, because they allow you to really voice your feedback uh, in more than just this survey form. So on to the next question. Um, we asked already a little bit of feedback on the proposed AI definition, but you might have more specific input for us that we really value to create this um, position paper. Don't forget that um, if you don't have time or the um, keypad on your telephone is a little bit, little bit difficult to use that you can also like different um, 
messages from other people. And that way we also know what to prioritize. Also, we are nudging a little bit. You are steered to first add what you think is good about the AI definition and you need to use the drop down menu to choose what you think is bad or unclear. But since we're transparent oh, about this nudging, I people say they can't write, Rob. You cannot vote anymore. It's, it's ah, not yes. It's, ah, there we are. AI interfering with our um, hmm. democratic process, I fear. <laughs> I think one of the questions that also returned uh, in the chat is that uh, yeah, the definition isn't clear about where software um, sits in this whole discussion. And I think that's already a really important one to consider. As you can see on my screen, the nudging effect cannot be underestimated. We have a lot of things you think are really good or of course, the regulation just is already really good. We'll never know unless we change this and host the seminar again, but I guess it will be difficult. Yeah, Hello, do you think to should we move yeah. to the next question? Maybe we keep it one, like 30 more seconds open. <laughs> A list can never be complete. I like that one. I think indeed it's too broad. What a software is um, is highlighted. Eh? What's the difference between AI and software? A good start. <laughs> Positive note, eh? uh, defining AI is always difficult. Um, all right, very valuable input. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see that there is still a lot of good as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. OK, let's move to the next question. I have um, six more questions. The last one is more of an open question to end, but um, that's still quite a lot. And I'm really happy to see that people are still answering this. So what is the question here? What do you like, dislike, and find clear about proposed risk? Based approach. You can always click on um, the icon to see to what slide we are referring if you need a freshening up of your memory. You will need a lawyer. <laughs> that's actually a comment we're hearing a lot, and that uh, mm. a lot of law firms and consultancies will have quite some work with mm. this proposal. But since it's put in the like category, it's probably a lawyer who posted it. I would also like to vote for the dislike that indeed um, you would need a lawyer or at least to help you with interpretation. And I, I guess that will be a limiting factor to make sure that everyone understands this regulation was able to apply it. Okay, I'm seeing diminishing returns as people are leaving to eat from their soup or potatoes. So I'll wait for um, 20 more seconds and I will move to the next question. And Rob, just a question to you. Can people reply to these questions later or is now really the moment? No, so I can still send the, the form later, but um, the best moment is now. Um, 
mm. but we will send it out. So if someone is unable to answer now, we will still be able to add to these questions later. Or at least I will try to make sure that that is possible. Okay, we will move to the next question. And I thank you again for your participation. This really helps our work. Did we already want to add to the high-risk artificial intelligence mm. systems or rather uses for AI, uh, which I found a really good nuance uh, in the debate? Yeah, I think here you can also highlight if these high-risk um, applications uh, already are in the regulation. Uh, so you can highlight them as well. Uh, so, but to get a view, did they, did they make the list uh, in, in a correct way? Or are there things that, that, uh, that fall out of it maybe? You see AI uses by the public sector. <laughs> And again, you it's can- uh, getting very busy. You can also like each other's answers, uh, which explains why these things are moving at a very fast rate for the moment. So fast, I'm feeling a little bit nauseous, which is good because that way we save some time before you have to work for your dinner. I think we can conclude that the high risk list might be extended based on the replies that we're getting here. I think so, yes. Okay, I'll wait 10 more seconds and then we can go to the next question. Which is, which is about a uh, topic that we did not really touch during uh, the panel yet. I think um, the regulatory sandbox is one of the possible solutions. We move there right now. So what do you think about regulatory sandboxes? This has been mentioned as one of the tools or measures in the AI regulation. I must say, I find the word clouds really confusing as a format <laughs> to use on this large uh, scale. Um, and especially if it's just one word uh, replies, yes. people are getting tired. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I suggest we move nothing. to the next question. All right, good input, I think. So. This one is an important one because we had a lot of uh, people from private companies uh, in the audience, according to our poll. Um, so what should we prioritize to help small scale providers and users of AI? These are the measures put forward in the AI regulation. You can drag and drop mm -hmm. on your screen, whichever prioritization you find most important. And of course, if people need to leave in the meantime, I see some messages in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, and those who can stay, it's a great moment to give us your input because now it's all fresh in your mind. You just heard panel presentation and keynotes about it. So 
So, and as we said earlier, we will use that also as a basis to draft the first position paper for the consultation. And we will also use this to see whether uh, using MOOC Lab or any other online participation form could really help in um, I think the increased uh, need for public consultations in the regulations mm. and other proposals at the European level. We have four more minutes, so I suggest we move to yep. the second last question. Uh, where we ask you to consider where you think the biometric identification should be banned or allowed. Hmm. Also, again, under specific serpent. No, no, under specific circumstances. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So, indeed, um, it's I, they make a distinction in between how it's um, how it's used in the AI regulation, um, and we wanted to gauge a bit your views. Uh, um, because it seems in private um, usages would still be possible in a way. Um, and we see some replies, it should be banned um, in all public places. Oh. Smart doorbells, maybe iPhone cameras would still be okay. Also applications of it. You're right, once you get used to unlocking your phone with your face, it's really hard to turn back, to go back, I guess. Mm. All right, I really want to go to the next question as well, because this is the open question. And yep. What other remarks and questions do you have? I think that's one of the most important ones. Also, we should do, next time, we should try to spot smart questions in the chat and try to put them in MOOC lab, I don't know whether that's possible, that would be great because I think the smartest questions were asked by the audience and were not part of this MOOC lab. So let's go to that last question and ask what your remaining questions are on the proposed AI regulation. I think the purpose here is this, I, it's, it's a very big document eh, and it touches up on a lot of things, eh, um, but mainly what we're going to capture is what are your open questions, eh? open concerns, what's unclear, uh, what need, needs to be more clear. Eh? Um, so basically, this is a, a white sheet and where you can really give your, your input, eh? which we can then, as, as mentioned, use to build our position paper. What do we see here already? How to make it pragmatic. That's always a difficult one, I think. Eh? Um, what's the timeline uh, that we can answer, I think, Natalie? Um, a little, yeah, little bit. <laughs> it's difficult to predict, of course. So, so as I mentioned, this proposal will now be discussed by the European Parliament and the Council, and then they will negotiate together with the European Commission um, a, a new version. Basically, the proposal can still be adapted. So, it's also possible that what you, what you've seen today presented might change um, in next uh, draft proposals. Um, if we compare it to, for instance, the GDPR and how much time it took to get agreement on that, that was about four years between the first proposal of the Commission of the GDPR and then the adoption, and then two more years uh, before it entered into force. So that was six years. Now, of course, we can hope that this time it goes a little bit faster. Um, it's also not entirely the same type of regulation, but still it deals with quite complex matters where there are a lot of stakeholders involved that have quite differing opinions sometimes. So it's difficult to predict, but in terms of timeline, I think it's safe to say it, it might take years rather than months. Oh, maybe another question I see, I think we can answer. Eh? When is a system explainable and inter interpretable enough? Um, basically, um, for these requirements, there will be quite a heavy reliance on the usage of standards. Eh? Um, and these standards and benchmarks are yet to be set. So at the moment, it's not really um, something you can do already and uh, check your, your, if you have an appropriate level ex of explainability, but this is something which will evolve in the, in the coming year. Yeah, and maybe to reply to the question, how will it be discussed internationally? In any case, the European Commission is also participating in discussions ongoing at the Council of Europe, discussions at UNESCO, and in other international organizations. So in general, you see quite some 
um, overlap, but also um, discussions ongoing between international organizations to try to keep their work a little bit consistent. Um, and of course, uh, there will also be discussions bilaterally with other countries. Uh, the US, for instance, and other regions are also quite interested um, in this proposal, especially since the proposal, and we also did not discuss that in details, but the geographic scope goes beyond the EU. So it also applies to providers and users that are not established in Europe, but they're established outside of Europe, like the US, China, etc but that are nevertheless used or have an effect in Europe. So this proposal is interesting, not just um, within the EU. Will there be a checklist for developers to be able to easily categorize the risk level? Um, yeah, I assume that there will be some guidance or further guidance published, but in a way, I, if you would use the I, or read the AI regulation, it can already be a bit clear uh, um, which applications will be then considered high risks, but I assume that there surely will be guidance uh, to make it very clear what application is high risk and which isn't. All right, that's already some valuable input. Um, I think we arrived at the end now of the, uh, the feedback gathering session. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for staying uh, for this 15 more minutes. Uh, this is valuable in input for us, which we will, uh, we will use. Uh, Natalie, you have, want to have a final comment or, or Rob? Uh, I just want to thank everyone for the input provided. Uh, yeah. And I see Nathanael is back on the screen. So maybe we can uh, leave the closing work because he gave closing remarks beforehand, but then we yeah. wanted to collect your feedback still. So uh, yeah, that is so great that we have gathered uh, so much feedback. Uh, more than 100 people have uh, attended until the end. So great preparation and uh, hope to see you uh, soon for our next event on AI for Belgium of the next event of AI ethics and law. All right. Thank you thank so much, Nathalie and Yella. Thank you to everyone as well. And see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.